We would have had a worse financial crisis than 2008 had the Fed not stepped up. Now, that doesn't mean they did the right thing. They did the wrong thing. They, they should have allowed the crisis because a worse crisis is going to result from the delay. They always kick the can down the road because they'd rather have a problem tomorrow, even if it's a bigger problem tomorrow, than a smaller problem today because then it's somebody else's problem. But I think the banking system is completely insolvent in the United States. I think it is in much much worse shape than it was in 2008 when it collapsed. And usually people will say, well, yeah, there's problems, but it's not, not like 2008. But they think it's not like 2008 because it's not as bad. It's actually not like 2008 because it's much worse. There's two big real estate problems or problems the bank has. In 2008, the problem was mortgage loans that went into default. People stopped paying their mortgage. And the reason this was a problem for the banks is because when somebody doesn't pay their mortgage, well, you gotta sell the house. That's the collateral for the loan. But if you remember back then, people were making zero down loans. And so they didn't have much and real estate prices went down. So I loaned somebody 500 grand to buy a house. Now the house is worth 300 grand. The fact that that's happened in and of itself is an incentive for the borrower not to pay. And especially if they had a teaser rate on their mortgage. So their mortgage started out and the guy was paying maybe 2,000 a month, but now he's paying 3,000 a month, but he only makes, you know, 2,000 a month, whatever he was. He was paying a lot of money for his mortgage because he thought he was gonna get rich owning a house. When it turns out that he went broke, he's not gonna make that payment. Why make payments when you're so underwater? It's worse for the borrower, although the borrower just walked away. If they put a down payment, they lost it. You know, you could go and rent a place or do something else. So the problem was when the loan defaulted, the bank lost. And you know, when I was a critical of the adjustable rate mortgages and nothing down and things like that, I never criticized it from the point of the borrower. I always said the borrower was smart to put nothing down because then you got nothing to lose. I mean, if somebody is dumb enough to let you free roll, right? Putting a down payment was the mistake. The, the problem with a zero down or low down, no doc, arms was the lender the lender was giving somebody you know a free bet on real estate so hey, i'm not gonna buy it? this real estate if heads i win tails the bank loses well it was tails <laughs> the banks lost and and so they lost money and you know a lot of banks should have failed and unfortunately they got bailed out by by the government but most mortgages did not default it was still a small percentage but that was enough to wipe out the bank capital because they didn't have a lot of capital it was a big pyramid well today it's the opposite problem the problem isn't the mortgages that default. It's the ones that are current that keep paying because this time real estate prices haven't crashed. The mortgage prices have crashed. So the homeowner doesn't own the mortgage. He owes the mortgage. He owns the asset. The bank owns the mortgage. The mortgage has crashed. So if I loan somebody $500,000 at 3% and they don't have to pay me back for 30 years, what's the present value of that mortgage? Oh, well, maybe 30, 40% half. So the banks are underwater, not on the real estate, but on the mortgages. Now, the borrowers, they're gonna pay. They're not gonna stop paying on these sweetheart deals. They got 3%. Right? They're gonna they're gonna they're gonna take that mortgage to the grave. It's the only thing that's not going up, right? Everything the price of everything is going up except your mortgage. The the mortgage is the homeowner's biggest asset. It's the bank's biggest liability. So the banks are losing money on every mortgage. And the homeowners aren't going anywhere. Even if they wanted to, they can't. They can't sell because they can't buy anything else because they can't get that mortgage. The mortgage is importable. They can't take the mortgage from one house and move it to another house. And the buyer of their house can't even assume that mortgage. So they're stuck there, right? So the real estate market's not moving. Houses aren't for sale. So home prices are still high. No one could afford to buy because the price is structured for 3% mortgages and they're 7%. So the housing market is dead. But so the banks have lost a ton of money, but it's not just mortgages they bought. They bought treasuries and things like that. So they're way underwater. That's why the banks can't afford to pay interest. Go to your bank and say, hey, how much interest can I get? Well, I can't get anything. Oh, then I want my money. I'm taking my money out of your bank. I'm going to put it in a money market where I can get 5%, right? That's the crowding out. Everybody's loaning money to the government. The banks don't have any money. That's why the banks had to go to the Fed. Why did the banks need money? Because the depo depositors wanted their money and the banks didn't have it. Well, they still don't have it because they gave it to the customers. How are they gonna repay these loans in March? That's why I think they're gonna extend this program. If the Fed doesn't extend this, 
that's going to create a bigger run on the banks because you're going to have to take your money out of a bank if you're worried it's going to fail because the FDIC only goes to 250,000 now what is it yep. you know so if you've got a lot of money to bank you're not going to leave it there you're going to take it out and put it in one of the too big to fail banks so any bank that's not too big to fail is going to fail that's another example of where the government comes in and and distorts the market because they give a comparative advantage to the bigger banks uh, but the other thing I wanted to point out about why the banks are insolvent it, particularly a lot of the regional banks, it's not just a residential mortgage book, it's commercial. And commercial is a different problem. Commercial is more like 2008, where it's the default problem and the collapse of commercial real estate values. Because when people bought a lot of this commercial real estate, interest rates were at zero. And commercial real estate is like a bond. It trades at a cap rate. And the lower interest rates are, the more commercial real estate is worth. Because what investors just do is they look at the income, right? And they compare it, well, I can buy this piece of property and collect rent, or I can buy this bond and, and clip coupons. So it's, you know, it's the interest rate determines the value of the commercial real estate. So when interest rates were at zero and, and you had rental streams from property, commercial property prices went way up. And that was also helpful because in 2008, when the banks were losing money on their residential loans, they weren't losing any money on their commercial loans because commercial real estate went up and everybody paid. But now what's happened? Well, you had COVID and that started the work from home craze. So a lot of office space is empty. So now you have all this WeWork space, right? WeWork didn't, that was my joke always, always about it. But, uh, but now you have all that space on the market, right? They were some of the biggest tenants in the major major markets in the country. Uh, that space is up for, up for sale. Interest rates have risen a lot, so that's also brought down real estate. But the rents have collapsed because the properties are, the offices are vacant. Then you also have uh, shopping centers, malls that are half empty. Why? Well, not only are people working from home, they're shopping from home. Uh, and they're shopping less because they're spending all their money on food. On, on rent, on utilities, on a healthcare. They don't have as much money left over for, you know, things that, you know, restaurants or, or stores, you know, that they would just go and buy, buy things that they don't really need, just stuff that they, you know, they like. So you have all these vacancies that have collapsed the income. So commercial real estate prices, you look at most markets, they're down 30%, 40%, 50%. And in some cities, you know, where the crime has exploded ever since, uh, you know, we had the Black Lives Matter protest with, um, Chauvin and uh, George Floyd and all that stuff when you know all the police just stopped enforcing the laws and they stopped lock locking up the shoplifters insurance rates have gone through the roof losses due to theft so stores are shutting down and a lot of uh, employers don't even want their workers coming to work they're afraid so this this these are huge losses for the banks because the owners of this commercial real estate when you borrowed let's say you borrowed 200 million dollars from a bank to buy a piece of property and that property is now worth a hundred million dollars and your loan was seven years and now it comes due and when you borrowed the money you were paying you know four percent and now they want ten I mean what's the odds that you're gonna you know even want to stay in? no you're gonna mail in the keys you're gonna give the bank back the building better give them a hundred million dollar building than a 200 million dollar cash so the banks are looking at massive losses on their commercial real estate at the same time they have massive losses on all their residential mortgages and go and government bonds so the whole banking system is completely insolvent and the fed hasn't even raised rates anywhere near high enough to get rid of inflation we actually need much higher rates than, than where the fed stopped and not only do we need fed to tighten more we need the government to tighten because you need contractionary fiscal policy as well as monetary policy right you can't have one without the other because the engine of inflation is the government spending more than it collects in taxes because you're, you're you're putting artificial demand into the economy now it's worse when it's monetized by the fed when the fed is ex printing the money to buy the bonds that facilitates this extra spending but budget deficits are still two trillion plus per year that's stimulative policy and also look at the credit markets Consumer debt is at an all-time record high. Credit card debt is at an all-time record high. Household debt, the savings rate continues to plunge. Everybody keeps spending. Well, that's the fuel for the inflation. What the Fed needs to do to put this inflation genie that it let out of the bottle on purpose, right? It's not like this happened out of left field. Not only do they have to contract the money supply, which is growing again, 
rather rapidly, but they have to contract credit and they have to change uh, people's behavior. They have to increase savings and reduce consumption and spending. That's how you fight inflation, but we haven't done that at all. And if you go back to the very definition of inflation, which is an expansion of the supply of money, it also includes credit. Inflation is an expansion of the supply of money and the supply of credit. So credit expansion is inflationary and we've had credit expanding the entire time that the Fed was fighting inflation, which means the fight has been inadequate. Now, why has inflation come down the way they measure it? It was 9%, now it's 3%. Well, again, nothing goes in a straight line, right? So maybe it goes nine, then it goes three, and the next move is 12, right? It's just in a wave up. The trend is is higher, right? You'd want to buy the dip in inflation, right? <laughs> if you're looking at that. But the main reason inflation came down was the market anticipated all the rate hikes and that strengthened the dollar. The dollar index rose about 30%. And in that environment, brought down oil prices, commodity prices, and the strong dollar put a lid on import prices. So that helped. We also had a small contraction in the money supply after a major expansion. But quantitative tightening, yeah, which is now pretty much ending. The Fed's rate hikes are over. So now the markets are starting to look at the rate cuts, which is gonna weaken the dollar. So ironically, the Fed says, hey, we've won our inflation fight. We can cut rates. By indicating that, inflation is gonna come roaring back because that brings down the dollar, right? It's actually loosening the financial conditions. But I think the dollar is turning. I think it's top, it's getting ready to fall. Commodities have bottomed, oil is bottomed. Uh, we're gonna start to see a, a big move up. And the Fed is in a box now because it's promised the market rate cuts. It can't you know, pull the rug out from under it. But when inflation really surprises, the thing that's gonna be a big problem is we're gonna be in a recession. In fact, we're probably in a recession right now. You know, the, I know the economic data doesn't say that. You know, we just got this, you know, big GDP number, right? 3.3%. Unemployment is really low. But they were saying the same thing in the summer of 2008. They were saying we're not going to have a recession, even though they were in one. It's just that the government data didn't recognize the Great Recession that started in December of 2007. They didn't recognize it until December of 2008. So the government in December of 2008 came out and said, you know what? All the economic data we released for the last year was wrong. All the good data was actually bad data. We've been in a recession the whole time and they went and revised down everything. So they could just as easily do the same thing now. They could come back and say, you know what? You know all those good numbers that we gave you? All those jobs that we said were created? They actually weren't created. We actually lost millions of jobs. And you know all that economic growth that we said was there? Actually, we, we were in recession the whole time. They could easily come back and do that. And I think it's, it's likely that they will. And I think that the reason that Joe Biden is so unpopular, I mean, it's unprecedented how unpopular but nobody has ever been less popular. And the same thing with uh, Kamala Harris. She's the most unpopular vice president ever. Why? What does she do? I mean, she, I, don't, I don't know. I, could you name anything she stands for, anything she's done that would justify this degree of unpopularity? I think it's just the voters taking out their frustration on how bad the economy is. The economy stinks and the American electorate tends to either blame or credit. So if the economy is bad, the White House gets credit. I mean, if the economy is good, the White House gets credit. If the economy is bad, they get the blame. Whether it's their fault or not, the voters are just going to vote their pocketbooks. Remember Henry uh, Carville, it's the economy stupid. Well, if you want to know why Biden is so unpopular, it's the economy stupid. Right. So the economy is bad. So the media keeps saying there's a disconnect between the voters and the economy. No, the disconnect is between the data and the economy. The voters have got it right. The economy is awful.